Hello everyone, David here. In this video I'm going to show you how to turn on your home PC remotely and then stream some games, be they from Steam or the Epic Games launcher, and then play them over the internet and then turn off your PC when you're done. Okay, let's go. The very first and most basic thing you can do is just enable streaming in Steam. So um, open up Steam and then go to settings, uh, remote play, and then tick this little box here, enable remote play. Um, and then if you have previously paired devices, they'll appear here, but if, you, if you're setting this up for the first time, you won't. Um, let's just go through some of that setup process again, just so you can see it. Um, what you want to do is go to the App Store and search for Steam Link, and then download that. And then once you have this app, um, you should be prompted to log in. Uh, and then if you start playing and try connecting to your host PC, it will prompt you for a pin. So that'll appear on screen. Type that into your host PC, and then you'll start streaming. And this is already 80% of the way there. You can now play games on your phone with a virtual keyboard um, through big picture mode in Steam. And uh, this will actually work anywhere in the world if your PC is turned on. Um, but we'll come to um, actually turning it on remotely a little bit later. Let's try um, through a laptop as well. Okay, so I'm now in our remote testing lab downstairs. I've got my MacBook and my Bluetooth wireless gamepad, and uh, let's try playing some games remotely. So now when I log into Steam and go to my library on my Mac, um, I can now get the option to stream various games. So instead of the play button, this button now says stream. So um, these are all the games that are either installed on this computer or available to stream from the host PC. They've changed the UI. Okay, how do you get in game now? So here we are playing Cyberpunk on a MacBook with an Xbox gamepad. Now, ordinarily, this wouldn't be possible. Um, you might be able to get it to run, uh, if not now, then in the future um, through parallels or crossover, um, but it would not look this good and run at this high a frame rate. Um, now, there is a little bit more lag because we're playing the game over the network and there's that ping time to contend with. Um, but if you can get a good connection with low latency, this is still a really viable option for playing the game. Um, and in fact, this is what all the streaming services like uh, Stadia um, are now doing. But we're cutting them out of the picture um, and hosting the game ourselves. And then we kind of have similar options when we want to play on our phone. We can either connect a Bluetooth controller and play it in a similar kind of way, um, or something I quite like is the Razer Kishi. Um, and this works by, you just uh, unclip it and then pull it apart, and then slot your phone into the middle of it. And then it becomes some kind of remote gaming device. Uh, and then from here, You'd start up Steam Link just as before, um, but it will recognize this as the controller. Uh, you just want to make sure that light comes on there just to make sure it's on and then start playing. And it's like you're in big picture mode, um, but with this as a controller instead. Um, and it works very nicely. Reminds me of this one dive in Arroyo we used to sometimes do sets in Friday nights. So there you go, that's the basic setup. And Steam should still work even if you're not on the same local network, as long as the computer, the host PC is still turned on. Um, but that's not really convenient to leave your computer running the whole time while you go on holiday. So let's look at some ways to turn on your computer remotely and also shut it off when you're done. And for that, we're gonna need a Raspberry Pi. So this is the Raspberry Pi 4. It is a very cool and surprisingly cheap little computer. Um, I got this for about 40 pounds from eBay, and then I paid about another five pounds for the plastic case. When you buy a Raspberry Pi, you literally just get the board itself and nothing else. Um, you'll also need a micro SD card to go in there, and that kind of is the storage for the whole computer. Um, recommend getting one at least 32 gig to give you a bit of expandability. Uh, it's USB-C powered, so you'll need a USB-C power supply if you don't have one already. And you'll probably want to pick up one of these, which is a micro 
HDMI to HDMI cable, um, just so you can plug it into a display and actually see what you're doing. Um, I recommend you plug it in wired using ethernet cable to your router, just for simplicity, and it'll make everything run a little bit quicker. Okay, let's get this guy plugged in and then set up for remotely waking our host PC over the internet. Okay, so the first thing you want to do is to take that flashcard um, that you're going to put into your Raspberry Pi and go and download Raspberry Pi Imager. So go and get Raspberry Pi OS and then whichever system you're installing it from, probably Windows, you can go and download that. Once you run that, it needs an install. Once you run that, you can then uh, choose which operating system you want. You probably want just the plain Raspberry Pi OS 32-bit version. Um, and then storage, you pick your flash card and then hit write. And it will take some minutes to prepare that um, SD card for the Pi. Once it's finished writing, you take that SD card, put it into the Pi, and then connect that up to your monitor. You'll probably need a USB keyboard and mouse to get through the OS setup process. Uh, and then once you're into Raspberry Pi OS, we're ready to set up SSH and VNC so that we can enable the Wake on LAN feature for our PC. So this is something like how it will look when you get your Raspberry Pi booted for the first time. Uh, the very first thing you want to do is go and change the password. So um, if you haven't already changed it during the setup process, um, go to this little box up here, which is the terminal. Um, if it doesn't appear up there, then go to the Raspberry icon and then accessories and open terminal that way. And then you're going to want to type P-A-S-S-W-D password, and then it will prompt you for the old one. The default is raspberry, all lowercase, and then type in your new password, something as unique and unguessable as uh, you can imagine. And now we're going to go to preferences, Raspberry Pi configuration, and here we want to go to interfaces and enable SSH. And you'll probably want to enable VNC while you're at it as well, so that you can use your Pi over VNC over your local network. Um, and that will just make it a bit easier to maintain over time if you need to change anything. So we need to install a package which sends the network packet which wakes up our host PC. And that's a package called EtherWake. And we're going to open up the terminal again. And we are going to type into the terminal sudo, which is like super user do. So it's giving us like the root access privileges. apt-get install and then the name of the package, which is Etherwake. And then it will do a little bit of work and download it from the internet. Um, and then that is ready to go. We now need to make sure that the PC is set up, ready for being woken over the LAN. So there are a few things you're going to need to do to get the host PC ready for being woken remotely. And the first is to use a wired connection. So go and find the ethernet port um, on the back of your computer. If it doesn't have one, I'm afraid you're sunk. You're gonna have to move on to the next section. Um, but if it does, get a bit, of, a bit of ethernet cable, connect it to that port, and then connect the other end to your router. And then you can even disable Wi-Fi on the host PC if you want. Um, a wired connection will just universally be better than Wi-Fi because it will have a, a lower latency um, and also higher bandwidth. So it'll make your streaming connection more reliable and also a bit snappier. So after that's connected, we're going to need to go and check on a few settings. So press the Windows key and type Device Manager. Open that up and then scroll down to Network Adapters. And then you're going to want to find the one that looks something like Realtek PCIe Family Controller, whichever is the Ethernet card, which is now connected. And then go to Advanced and scroll down to wake on magic packet and make sure that is enabled and then also wake on magic packet when system that get cut that gets cut off but i think it is when system is in sleep and you want to make sure that is enabled as well and then go to power management and you want to make sure this tick box allow this device to wake the computer is ticked and then you can tick this other one only allow a magic packet to wake the computer if you want. We're going to be using a magic packet, so if you don't want your computer to be woken any other way, you can tick that box, but the second one is less important. So once we've got those settings in place, we then need to find the MAC address of this computer. And this is kind of like a, a unique code that identifies any network device. 
and uh, it never changes, so it's going to be useful for waking this exact PC. So again, press the Windows key and go to Settings, and then go down to Network and Internet. This is Windows 11, might look a little bit different in Windows 10, but it'll be very similar. And then go to Ethernet, because that's the connection we're now using, uh, and then scroll down to the bottom here until you see Physical Address. Um, now, I've blurred mine out because I don't want everyone to know my private details, but it will be some string of alphanumeric digits. You should get six groups of two digits each, and you want to write that down somewhere or copy and paste it, put it in a notepad, something like that. You're definitely going to need that um, later on. So we're now ready for a little test. So go back to your Raspberry Pi, um, find the terminal window, and then um, turn off your PC so it's ready to be woken up. And then into the terminal, you want to type sudo etherwake dash i, and then eth0, which means it's using its ethernet port as well. And then the MAC address, which you just copied or wrote down. So, and this time it wants to be separated with colons, not dashes. So I'm gonna put mine in. And if everything is working, then that should have just woken up your PC. We're now ready to move on to the next step, which is waking it up remotely over the internet. So the first thing we're going to need is the IP address of the Raspberry Pi on your local network. So we're going to find that out by opening terminal again and typing ifconfig, and then it should come up um, as inet, and then this address up here. So in my case, it is 192.168.1.225. And then you're going to want to go to your router and log into it. So open up Google Chrome on your PC or on your Raspberry Pi if you want, and go to whatever the router's address is on your local network. This is probably 192.168.1.1. It is in 90% of cases that, but it might be 192.168.0.1 or .255.255. .255. If you look on the back of the router, it will probably tell you what its IP address is by default. And you'll also need the router's uh, login and password. So that's usually something like admin password um, because you can't log into it from the internet, again, by default. Um, but again, on the back of the router, go and find its username and password for logging in to maintain it. And then you'll see something like this. It won't be exactly like this, but it'll be vaguely similar. And you want to go to the advanced settings and set up port forwarding. And then you want to add a rule. And you can call this whatever you want. So something like uh, SSH for wake on LAN, maybe, or maybe just call it SSH is fine. Service, if it lists SSH in here, that's fine. You can click that and you're basically uh, almost ready. Um, otherwise, you want to enable it for TCP and UDP, and on external port 22 and internal port 22 as well. Um, you can fiddle around with port numbers, but it starts getting a bit more confusing. External host will be everyone, so star, um, and internal host will be the address of the Raspberry Pi, so 192.168.1.0. 225 in my case, but yours will almost certainly be different. And when that's done, you can click add to add that rule. And then you should see your new rule listed in the port forwarding list. And you'll just want to go and click apply if you haven't already. Hello everyone, future David here. Now by forwarding port 22 on our router to our Raspberry Pi, we've opened the gates to a potential world of hackers who might try and log in and then get access to your network. So what I recommend is you actually change the default Pi account to one of your own username. And to do this, um, open up a terminal and type sudo password root to create a root account password. And then you'll use raspi config to reboot the Pi straight to the terminal instead of the GUI. Once you're there, log in as root and then type usermod minus L and then your new username space Pi and then type usermod minus M minus D forward slash home forward slash your new username space and your new username again. And then you can use raspi config to reboot the Pi back into the GUI. And then once you're there, open up a terminal window and type sudo password minus L root to remove the root account so that you can't log in as root anymore. 
All of this just improves the security. Someone could still potentially find a way to log into your Pi with your own username and password. This just makes it much less likely. If you're still worried, I suggest you look into a VPN or something that could potentially encrypt all of the traffic you send to your home network. And please do all of this at your own risk. If you're still worried about security, just don't do it. Everywhere else in this video where I've used Pi as the username, just remember to replace that with your new username instead. Okay, on with the video. Okay, I know this might seem like an awful lot of complicated things, but we are close. We just need some way now of accessing our Pi and getting it to send that magic packet to wake up our PC. And there are quite a few different ways of doing this, but the way I recommend is through an app on your phone called Pi Helper. So um, go onto the app or Play Store um, and find an app called Pi Helper, all one word, and then go and download that. And then once you open that up, uh, you then want to add a connection. And before we bother with the internet, I'd just get it working on the LAN first. So make sure you're connected to the same network as your Pi and your host PC. You can connect the phone by Wi-Fi, that's fine. And just add a connection called something like Pi LAN, just so you know what it is. The host is the IP address of the Raspberry Pi that we discovered earlier, which in my case is 192.168.1.225, but for you it's probably something different. And the port is 22 because we're connecting by SSH. Username will be Pi unless you changed it, and the password will be the password you changed it to before, which will be different from mine. Um, so you can test the connection first worked for me. If it didn't work, make sure you're connected to the Wi-Fi. Again, make sure all of your computers and the phone can see each other. You can try pinging them if you have to. Um, and now we've got access to the Pi from our phone. And it's pretty cool. You get kind of a readout of its um, like stats about CPU and memory usage. Um, you can go in, you can actually connect to it through SSH by opening up a terminal window, um, which is really useful because now you can do Anything you can do on the terminal, you can do through your phone with Pi Helper. Um, and you can get some other interesting things like um, there's uh, file sharing through SFTP. Um, if you want to use your Pi just for file storage, you can now do that and access it on your phone. Um, and you can also play with like the um, input output pins and stuff on the Pi if you wanted to, I don't know, connect your Christmas lights to the Raspberry Pi. You could turn them on from here uh, in theory. Um, so in order to send our command, um, we're going to do it through a preset command. So go into that little uh, sandwich menu, go to edit commands, and we are going to add a command. And the one we're going to, we're going to add, call it something like uh, wake uh, PC. And then the command is going to be sudo etherwake dash i eth zero. So you need to put in your MAC address separated by colons between each of the pairs of digits. And when you're done, hit save. You'll go back to this main menu for the Pi. And now when you press the sandwich menu, you should see wake PC as an option. And if you tap that, that should wake up your computer. So I suggest you do another test now. Turn off your host PC and just using Pi Helper on your phone, try running that command and see if your PC wakes up. If it does, you're all good to go. If not, you need to go back and check your MAC address or one of the other steps we've done. We are so nearly there. The final step is just to do exactly that thing. So wake up our host PC, but from the internet instead. So on your phone, make sure that you turn off Wi-Fi and then you should connect to whatever cellular data you have on your phone, 3G or 4G probably. Um, and then in Pi Helper, go to add a connection. This time we're going to add Pi brackets WAN, so wide area network and not LAN. And for host, we need to find out the IP address of our router on the internet. So from your host PC, open a new tab and go to what is my IP and Google will tell you. I've blurred mine out so that I don't get hacked. Um, but then in the host um, section, you want to put in that IP address instead. So type that in, it should be four numbers separated by full stops. Port is going to be 22, just as before. And then username, pi, and password, whatever password you changed it to in our previous steps. And that is successfully connected. So let's save that as a new connection. And now you should see 
Pi LAN and Pi WAN. And you can use Pi LAN when you're on um, your own Wi-Fi network at home, and Pi WAN when you are outside of your home. So when you're in your office or um, just traveling on a train or if you're in a foreign country, for example. And now we're going to do the same thing as before. We're going to go to edit commands and add a command for waking up the host PC. So we'll call it wake PC again and exactly the same custom command you put in before. So sudo etherwake, save that. And now you should have a wake PC option. So the final test is to turn off your PC and then run this command and see if it works. Okay, so I'm now going into my Pi and I'm saying wake PC. Hey, and it worked. Yep, there we go, and we are starting up. There is, however, um, one final thing I wanted to show you, which is kind of really the icing on the cake to all of this, because your IP address on the internet will change periodically because your uh, internet service provider refreshes all of its connections regularly. And what would be really nice is if you had a single way of connecting that never changed. And there are services that will give you a kind of host name, um, which can be a literal name, that then redirects to your IP address that you know about. And the one that I like is noip.com. So if you go and sign up for an account, you can then add your own host name. And instead of connecting to your IP address in Pi Helper, you can actually add a connection which then uses that host name instead. So it could be Joe's PC, and then the host name will be that translated name. So it'll be something like Joe's PC .net. For example, what it would be whatever you specified in the sign up procedure, but then the port and username and password would all be exactly the same. You would still need to go and refresh the IP that it knows about, but the really cool thing is that a lot of routers now have the ability to go and update it automatically. So the router can periodically just go and update your IP address on the internet with the known host name. And that's usually somewhere in the advanced settings if your router supports it. So yeah, you might find it under DNS or DIN DNS, something like that. Um, you just want to turn that on, select the right provider and put your username and password into the router so that it can go and update your host name uh, every so often. And then you don't need to worry about it anymore. Um, a lot of the free services require you to go and just kind of refresh your um, registration every month. So you might still need to go back and log in. If you pay for um, a subscription to one of these sites, then you probably don't even need to do that anymore. So depending how much you want to spend on this, you can totally do it for free. Um, but if you wanted to spend a bit, uh, you can get it even more automated as well if you want. Okay, so there you go. We've kind of achieved everything now. You can turn on your PC from anywhere in the world, uh, play some Steam games, and then when you're ready, um, go to the power button in big picture mode and select turn off PC, um, and that will just shut it down. If you were playing on a laptop, you could actually switch to your phone so that you get access to big picture mode and then shut it off that way. But I did say we'd get Epic Games running as well, and this is where it gets a little bit more complicated because um, Steam has some issues with input uh, when it doesn't launch the game straight away or we have to go through the Epic Games launcher. So we're also going to use an app called Moonlight for streaming this part. Um, but let's get the Steam links set up first. So what you want to do is uh, open up Steam and then go to Library. And then where it says Add a Game, you want to add a non-Steam game. We're not going to find the actual game itself. We're going to find the Epic Games launcher. So go to Browse, and then this is usually installed in Program Files x86, and then into Epic Games, Launcher. You want Portal, not Engine, and then Binaries. Uh, assume you have a 64-bit system, and select the Epic Games launcher, and add selected programs. And then you should have an entry in here called Epic Games Launcher. We need to do a bit more work to this because we don't just want to launch the launcher, we want to tell it to launch the game as well. So you can put something else in here like, I don't know, FF7, and then the target is the Epic Games launcher. Start in there, that's all fine. But we need to add something to launch options. Here's where you want to switch back to the Epic Games launcher. And for the game you want to boot, go to these three little dots, drop down and press create a shortcut. This will now add on your desktop a shortcut to the game with a special link. 
So right click on that, go to properties, and then in the URL, you should have this rather interesting link to com.epicgames.launcher, apps, and then a big old string of digits. So you want to copy, control C, all of that, and we're gonna use that in Steam. Now, if you go back to Steam, back to the shortcut you were working on to your non-Steam game, properties, and now in launch options, just put that entire string. So now we're launching the Epic Games Launcher with that link to the game as the launch option. So you can now close that. And now when you select FF7 and press play in Steam, it's actually going to use the Epic Games Launcher to launch that Epic game. Now you might be able to launch the game directly bypassing the launcher, but more and more games nowadays require you to use the launcher in between. Um, I think to avoid exactly this kind of thing. You may see an error message that says something like, please use the Epic Games launcher instead. Okay, great, so that's working. Um, except we have a problem. Um, when you try and stream a game like this from a laptop, um, it will actually close down because the game doesn't launch quickly enough to maintain the connection. So you will not be able to stream this to a laptop. And also doing it this way, um, I tend to have a lot of problem with input. So to get around all of those issues and to be able to stream Epic Games to another laptop over the internet, I used a streaming system called Moonlight. Now, if you've already got the GeForce Experience installed, you can just go to the GeForce Experience and then go to this little gear icon, down to Shield, and then turn on Game Stream. And this allows your PC to stream games to Shield devices. Now, you may not have a Shield device. In fact, you probably don't. I don't. Um, but what you can do instead is to install a program called Moonlight. So once you've got that enabled, you want to go and get the app so that you can stream to a device. And you want to go and search for Moonlight Streaming, not Moonlight, or, or else you'll find a whole load of information about Moonlight the film. Um, but if you go to uh, Moonlight Streaming, you can then go to Client Downloads and download the right one for your platform. Um, if you were doing it on a phone, you want to go and search for Moonlight and then go and get that app and then open up the Moonlight app and you can add a host. Or if you're on the same local area network, it will probably appear automatically. So then go and tap on that device and you'll see a pairing pin. From here, go and put in the pin on your host PC and connect. And now you'll have some options for games you could run. Uh, I could launch Cyberpunk or Fez. On Apple iPhone, Steam doesn't show up by default, but you can actually get around that um, by going to add a link to it yourself. So if you go and find Program Files x86, Steam and then add a link manually to streaming client. That will then let you access Steam even from an Apple iPhone. And then, yeah, you can tap on Steam and you will start streaming Steam in big picture mode to your phone. So a lot like the setup using Steam natively to stream, but this time using Moonlight instead as an alternative. And Moonlight is pretty cool. You get a, a virtual gamepad just like before, or it supports the Razer Kishi on Apple iPhone. And you can also get access to um, different stats and you can manually change the resolution and bitrate and some other settings if you want. Now we're in Steam big picture mode, you can now go and find that link to the non-Steam game that you added using the Epic Games launcher and then run it from here. The great thing is that the virtual gamepad that Moonlight has set up now bypasses all of those problems with Steam input and it waits the correct amount of time for the game to launch as well. So now you should be able to play any Epic Games game uh, remotely through Moonlight, kind of going in through Steam Big Picture mode on the way. You are advised, vacate the area immediately. What a mess. The explosions at the reactor have caused numerous ongoing fires. So there you go, that's how to get your Epic Games running through Moonlight, through Steam, over the internet, streaming to your phone or laptop. Um, and when you're done, you can just back out of big picture mode and it'll give you the option to stop remote play. So that's it working over the LAN, which seems relatively easy uh, overall. Um, what you want to do is to enable this over the internet as well. And to do that, uh, you want to go to host downloads and go and get the internet hosting tool. So go and download this one. Um, and then run it, Moonlight Internet Streaming Tester. 
So once this tool has finished running, you might be lucky enough to see a message like this, this PC is ready to host over the internet. Um, but if not, if it complains that some ports aren't accessible, you need to go back to your router and then go and uh, forward all of the right ports to the IP address of your PC on the LAN. So again, we can find out what the, the IP address of our PC is by going to network and internet. Go and find the ethernet connection again. And then you should see in IPv4 address something like 192.168.something.something. In my case, it's 1.28. And then you want to forward all of those ports that Moonlight mentioned to your host PC instead. And then try running the tool again and it should work. Okay, so we've kind of got everything set up. I think the only thing remaining is to do a final test. I'll go somewhere that is not here and see if I can connect over the internet from my laptop and play an Epic Games game streaming and see if it's any good. Okay, let's go. Okay, so welcome back to the remote testing studio. Um, what I'm going to do is I want to simulate being somewhere on the internet. So um, I've disabled Wi-Fi on my phone, made sure I'm using cellular data, and I have enabled a personal hotspot. And then on my Mac, I've made sure I'm using that personal hotspot and not the Wi-Fi. I've already installed Moonlight on the Mac, um, and I have paired my controller, so this will be ready to go in a second. Um, but as you can see, Moonlight can't connect right now because um, my computer's turned off. So let's use all of this uh, cool tech we've been working on, open up Pi Helper, and go and turn on the PC remotely. So we'll use the um, internet connection we made and just call Wake PC. It says command ran successfully, which is promising. So I'm hoping this exclamation mark will disappear. Now, if I'd had some sort of problem here and I hadn't been able to connect, um, I would have used VNC just to give it a little nudge and actually log in to the desktop remotely. So remember, this is not going over my LAN, it's actually using the hotspot on my phone, which will not be a particularly good connection, um, but it will sort of be quite rugged test to see if it works. So I'm now at my login screen, so I'll put in my pin, and the controller's working. So now I can go to my library, and I can play any of my Steam games, but I'm here to uh, test the Epic Games launcher game. So let's start that up. And this should start Final Fantasy VII. So what's happened is the Epic Games launcher is starting up in the background and that's getting ready to start Final Fantasy. So that causes an extra little delay. Okay, so what I'm seeing is um, a fair bit of audio crackling and it's telling me to reduce my bitrate. So let's go and have a fiddle with the settings. I think possibly my phone's internet connection is not sustaining a high bitrate. So I'm just gonna reduce the bit video bitrate to, let's try five megabits per second. Um, it's not gonna look as good, uh, but let's see if that can at least get it to run. In response, Cloud, up here, look up. Careful up here. This could collapse at any moment. Yeah, that's working very nicely. So I could totally play the game um, at that sort of quality. Um, with that kind of latency, it's preferable to playing through parallels on my Mac, which um, had very stuttery performance. Um, so if it's as good as that while I'm, you know, hundreds of miles away, um, then I'd be pretty happy. Let's try one more game. Wait, there's something up ahead. The extinction belt is thick above that area, so I can't detect anything from my end. Any other information? Yeah, 
Okay, so that was a fairly successful test. Um, the games were definitely playable. They didn't look great at 720p and fairly heavily compressed as well, but I think if I were using a different broadband connection to connect instead of the hotspot on my phone, I'd probably have a more reliable connection and probably higher bandwidth as well, so I could actually use more bitrate to, to compress the video. So, um, you know, I think this is a totally viable option. Um, I'm keen to try it out in a few other places and see how well it works. Um, but you know, there's always local gaming as well, and there are plenty of cool Mac games and games that run on the phone, so you're never really completely high and dry. Um, but I hope this has been kind of useful to you to see um, how you can set it up and how you can get it running kind of end to end. Hello, future David here again. Um, just a quick note about Steam's big picture mode. If when you exit the mode, um, you choose turn off system, that may put your PC in a state where it cannot be woken up from the LAN. So be careful with that one if you're gonna be remote for a long time. Instead, you can use suspend system and then wake up the PC from sleep mode, or alternatively just leave it and allow it to go to sleep on its own if you're using moonlight and you don't get the full list of options. Okay, back with the video. Okay, so there you go. Hopefully you followed along and got all of the things you wanted to get set up working. Um, if you have any comments or questions, please leave them down below and I'll do my best to address them. It is pretty complicated stuff um, and if you feel completely overwhelmed by it, well, there's always Stadia or GeForce Now or some other professional streaming service. The only downside is that, you know, they cost money, first of all, and also their games library will be somewhat limited, so you'll be stuck with whatever games they're offering. And in the case of Stadia, you may have to buy them again. Um, but, you know, they're going to be professional options that probably have better streaming capabilities than your own broadband connection. Probably, depending on what you have. So there you go, that's my video. I hope it was useful. If so, leave me a like down below and you can help me out by subscribing to my channel as well. Okay, see you next time.